everyone. Um, my name is Marion Fourcade, and I am the director of Social Science uh, Matrix. And I am very pleased to welcome you uh, to today's panel doing academic research with Mechanical Turk, uh, which is actually co sponsored by Social Science Matrix and the D Lab. For those of you who are new to Matrix, uh, we are Cross Disciplinary Social Science Research Institute at UC Berkeley. Today's event is part of our social science and data science series, which is a collaboration with DLab that we started three years ago. So we have many upcoming events this semester and we are working on more, uh, but let me mention just uh, a few. On October 25th, uh, we have an in-person matrix on point panel on new directions in studying policy. And on October 29th, we will have a virtual discussion on the rights and lives of non-citizens. Uh, you can check our Matrix website for further details, and you, know, you can also subscribe uh, to our newsletter. And now let me introduce the moderator of today's panel. Serena Chen is professor and chair of psychology and the Marian E. and Daniel E. Koshlan Jr distinguished chair for innovative teaching and research at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research focuses on the self and identity, interpersonal relationships and social power and hierarchy. She's a fellow of the Society of Personality and Social Psychology, American Psychological Association and Association of Psychological Science. Dr. Chen was also the recipient of the Early Career Award from the International Society for Self and Identity and the Distinguished Teaching Award from the Social Sciences Division at the University of California, Berkeley. So thank you very much, all of you, for being here. And without further ado, I now turn it over to Serena. Thank you, Marian. Um, OK, I have the pleasure of introducing um, the three panelists that we have today. So I'll give you a little background on them, and then they'll each um, give their remarks. Um, so on the panel today, we have Gabe Gabriel Lenz, who is a professor of political science here at Cal. He studies democratic politics with a focus on what leads citizens to make good political decisions, which what leads them to make poor decisions and how to improve these choices. And in his work, he draws on insights from social psychology and economics. And his research and teaching interests are in the areas of elections, public opinion, political psychology, and political, political economy. Then we also have Stefano Delavigna, who is the Daniel Koshlin Senior Distinguished Professor of Economics and Professor of Business Administration here at Cal. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the Econometric Society, and also an Alfred P. Sloan Fellow um, in the past, and a Distinguished Teaching Award winner here at Cal. His um, work is largely in the area of behavioral economics. He asks questions such as, what is the ability of experts to forecast research results? He analyzes gender differences and editorial choices in academic honors. And another example, he's, he's interested in the impact of nudges and bottlenecks in behavioral policy experiments. Last but not least, we have Ali Al Khatib. He is currently the interim director of the Center for Applied Data Ethics at the University of San Francisco. There, he applies social science to study human co computer interactions with a focus on how people relate to individual algorithmic systems and with algorithmically mediated social ecologies. Um, it's a delight to have the panelists. I'm interested. I use MTurk, but I'm interested to learn from others who use it as well. Um, we're going to start with Gabe um, and his um, remarks. Thank you, Mary and Serena and Eva for organizing this. Um, MTurk has uh, been a huge boon to the social sciences in general, partly because along with a lot of other online platforms, it has reduced the cost, uh, especially the administrative cost of running experiments. Here's a, a cover from Science Magazine in the early days of MTurk that mm -hmm. plotted all the MTurk workers around the world um, based on somebody probably uh, tracking their IP addresses, which they shouldn't have been doing. <laughs> and, uh, um, but I love the title here, social science for pennies is the phrase of this, and we all want to be able to get more research done for less money, and 
Mem Turk has lots of problems and lots of issues you all should be aware of, but I, it's still a net, it's been a positive and helped helped us get work done and helped us understand real world problems and real world behaviors. Um, uh, uh, I guess besides the general costs, another feature of Mechanical Turk that's really helped out is our ability to run panel surveys. It's where we interview people and then re-interview them a while, a while later. These are much more expensive administratively, um, and they're now much cheaper thanks to Mechanical Turk and super useful. So I'll just spend a little bit of time talking about the external validity concerns and internal validity concerns that weigh on my mind every time I decide to run another, another study on Mechanical Turk. And I've been a regular user since the very early days, um, but I'm also not most up to date on every uh, every single study. And there seems to be another study every few weeks published about mechanical mechanical Turk. Uh, so just partly because I'm first, probably the most important thing to say about mechanical Turk is that demographically, this is not a representative sample of the US population and you should never treat it that way. And if you're hoping to, generalize your findings to the US population don't don't use uh, don't trust mechanical turk on that front and the argument for it is that it's a more diverse sample than your typical lab sample that people would run experiments in before uh, before mechanical turk and you just have to be very conscious of what sorts of problems that mturk faces and any kind of claims about um, generalizability to the US population more generally. One of the uh, nicest studies that suggests that Mechanical Turk can, can generalize findings to the real world is this paper by Molnick, Struckman, and Fries. And they took 15, or actually 20 total studies that had been run on through something called tests. These are all experiments they had all gone through this review process and then be run through tests on uh, an NSF funded better sample that at least starts with a probability sample of US uh, homes. And they then tried to replicate all 20 studies on mechanical uh, Turk. And ahead of time, they uh, predicted that 15 of these would replicate and five wouldn't. And the five they predicted they wouldn't run or wouldn't replicate because those ones uh, were the treatment effects were especially focused on underrepresented populations on mechanical Turk. I think remember one of them was uh, an experiment where the effect largely originated from very religious uh, people, and mechanical Turk seems to be low um, on highly religious people. So that would just be one example. And much to their surprise and everyone else's surprise, uh, they uh, predicted accurately all the studies. So 15 of these studies did replicate the ones they predicted they would on Mechanical Turk. Um, and the five they predicted would fail to replicate, failed to replicate. Uh, and that's a reassuring finding. You should never, um, never trust for, uh, for sure that your study will necessarily uh, follow that same pattern, but it suggests some predictability in when and uh, when Mechanical Turk and when Mechanical Turk studies won't hold up on more representative sam samples of the US population. Um, partly because I work on elections and voting, and I'm very interested in representative samples of the US population. That's less true for, um, for researchers studying other, other topics. Uh, another general external validity concern that everybody worries uh, worries about all the time, and if you're not worried about it now, you should be, uh, is that people are very ter terrible, unpredictable lab animals. Um, unlike rats, they know when they're being studied, and they may behave in ways that are very different when they know they're being studied. They uh, sometimes, not always, exhibit demand characteristics, where uh, which is a phrase we use for when they uh, they do what the researcher wants them to do. Sometimes they resist treatment. They say, I know I'm being study. I know you're trying to push me around. I don't want to look like the kind of person that gets pushed around. And so we'll resist the treatment. Uh, in the real world, they might not do any of these other thing, uh, these, these things because they are not, they don't think they're being studied in the real world. Um, another one is that we can worry about a lot with voting is social desirability. People want to look like good voters 
They know what it means to be a good voter. They think good voters aren't partisan hacks. They think good voters care about issues and they do their best in any kind of study to look at to look like they're good voters. Um, and they may not do that in the real world. Um, we don't, you know, it's harder, it's harder to know. Um, so on Mechanical Turk, you especially worry that workers want to please. They really do seem often to want to please you. There's maybe been some decline in that over the over the years, but the number of like emails that I'll get from people apologizing that they missed the attention check on surveys and things like that just seems strange and kind of unusual, but it makes me worried that they are going to want to exhibit whatever effect um, we're trying to get out of them if they can tell what what effect uh, that would that would be. Um, workers, uh, we also worry about previous exposure um, in terms of external validity. Um, workers are exposed to lots of studies and learn a lot from from these. Uh, mechanical Turk workers are, for in my area, especially politically knowledgeable. They just know way more about politics than your typical ordinary person. And so if you're hoping to generalize to the population on something that's affected a lot by how knowledgeable people are about politics, it's not a great sample to, uh, to use in many ways. Um, uh, last sort of external validity thing, which is just applies to any kind of survey study that I'll just emphasize because it's always worth emphasizing is that survey data doesn't necessarily tell us about real world behaviors and encourage everyone to focus on studies that generalize to the real world um, and surveys can help us understand uh, these things but do work to validate your studies in various ways to suggest that they do try to use mechanical Turk in ways that you'll know will reflect more on the real world we always try to ask people about their actual members of congress when we're doing studies on voting um, or approval of their members we try to um, pipe in the names of candidates in local elections do sort of everything we can to make the studies be more about the real uh, real world. Um, there's lots of other ways of doing that. It's nice in any kind of, if you're trying to study some phenomenon in the real world, try to replicate it on Mechanical Turk and show that people on Mechanical Turk are exhibiting the same pattern you're seeing in the real world, and then you'll feel sort of safer studying it to some extent. All right, I'll just spend two minutes on internal validity. Uh, respondents um, are somewhat attentive on Mechanical Turk. Um, uh, so in terms of internal validity, this is where we 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 mm -hmm. care, especially if we have null effects that people are actually receiving the treatment. And we know that people don't read much in the real world uh, or on Mechanical Turk. Um, and uh, it's not a bad idea to screen out people who aren't paying much attention um, on Mechanical Turk. That has external validity issues. There's a nice paper just showing how people who don't pay attention on surveys uh, look different from your typical and Turk worker in a bunch of ways. Um, also need to worry quite a bit about differential attrition. So whenever you have people not answering um, your uh, the dependent variable in any study more in a treatment group than in a control group or um, dropping out of your study more in the control group than the treatment group, it undoes your experiment. And you can no longer count on treatment and control groups as actually uh, being similar to each other um, despite randomization. And there's a nice paper by Leif Nelson and colleagues, or not a paper, I think it's a blog post, just showing a, a study that got a really interesting effect and it was all due to treatment effect, uh, treatment respondents dropping out at higher rates. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something to always check, always worry, always worry about. Uh, a couple of quick tips. Most people are probably already aware of all these. Uh, oftentimes people connect Mechanical Turk with Qualtrics. Berkeley has a license uh, for, for Qualtrics, um, which is great. Qualtrics has a lot of built-in bot and repeat detection um, abilities. Yeah. Put them all in because there's a lot of bot and repeat to <laughs> repeat uh, um, users that are on Mechanical Turk. One terrible trade off you have to face with Mechanical Turk is that the more you pay, the more people appear to attempt to cheat. Uh, the more you attract the bots, the people who will take your try to take your survey multiple times, these sorts of things. 
it's such a I struggle with, with this trade off uh, with every study I, I do on mechanical Turk. You want to pay people more. You also don't want your studies full of uh, bots and people trying to take them many times. I don't know what the right answer is. Everybody struggles with this. Um, it's also good to know and also terrible that increased pay doesn't appear to increase attention or the quality of work that people do on Mechanical Turk. There's a couple studies with that finding. I don't know if I've seen anyone recently, um, but it also adds to the sort of terrible trade-offs you've got to make when you decide how much to pay people um, on this uh, on mechan Mechanical Turk. All right, I will end it there. Uh, thanks again and look forward to people's questions. Thank you, Gabe. Okay, now we have Stefano. So feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to them after all speakers. Thanks so much. Um, that was um, really such a thorough presentation. Not everything I say, nothing I disagree uh, with. I really, I think it's wonderful to have this detailed introduction. I just wanna have two caveats up here. One is I won't talk about ethical issues and two, uh, I'm not really an MTurk specialist, but I have used it in my research. I read a number of papers. I've edited papers that use this data. And so uh, I can just kind of contribute. And it's so interesting to see the perspective from an economist looks so similar from what I've just heard from the point of view of political science, which is great because the more, um, you know, we, uh, um, we can see things from two sides and we come to similar conclusions. Okay, so... Uh, Step back, not just pre-pandemic, but say 20 years ago, what do economists do broadly in terms of data? I mean, most of what we do, it could be like field data, like you have administrative data on firms, on workers, you've got some data set from eBay or trading cards or whatever, call that field data, field evidence for lack of a better word. Then there is a group of economists, a smaller group that runs laboratory experiments. Uh, I'll talk about some of that in a second. That's a little bit more like if you want you know, the experiments that are done also in the sciences, but they typically study things like generosity and time preferences. It's more like what uh, uh, psychologists do. Uh, and then the third group is, well, we rely a lot on surveys and there are some classical ones like the panel side of income dynamics, the national longitudinal survey, the NLSY, there is a RAND panel. There's lots of survey uh, panels where you ask people questions like, did you quit your job? Were you laid off? How much did you get paid? Do you, would you vote for this or that? You know, similar to also what Gabe was talking about. Well, uh, fast forward 20 years, so today or last year, and um, it's remarkable how MTurk has come big time in two out of these three data sources, which is like if you're studying, which is most of what economists do, but if you're studying data on inequality in pay or, you know, eBay or, uh, worker data, then mTOR hasn't played a big role. But if you're doing laboratory experiments, a lot of, you know, also self professed laboratory experimenters are now actually running experiments on mTOR or prolific other platform of that kind. So they're not anymore actually, or not as much running experiments in a laboratory, in a physical laboratory. So I'll come back to that. And then in a way that I wouldn't have thought of, but I gave correctly said is, surveys these days are kind of so often instead of one of these platform there is mini surveys run on platforms like mturk which is kind of really interesting because in a way the trade-off is do i pay 40 dollar or whatever 20 dollar per respondent in this natural representative maybe in survey where i'm embedded in a large survey or do i just have complete freedom i design what i want i'm going to pay less and i'm not going to have the link to everything it's not going to be representative but the sky's the limit in terms of what i can ask and a, a number of people have done work like that including people in areas you wouldn't think like our um, you know public financing inequality experts like Emmanuel Saez and you know at Harvard Stephanie Stancheva and Liliana Kuziemko when they wanted to know do people how do people respond to inequality they took on MTOR they recruited a bunch of people worrying about demand effects but they asked them what do you think is the right tax rate and how do you support an estate tax and stuff in the treatment group, same questions, but before they asked those questions, they told people, actually, this is how much inequality there is in this country, which people underestimate. And then, so they tried to see, does knowing about the actual numbers of inequality change your stated preference on taxation and stuff, which turns out it doesn't very much. But 
that's an example. You wouldn't think that the inequality public finance economies go to MTurk, but they did because it allows them to get bigger sample for some cost to tailor things. And so that's another big use uh, of this, just like Gabe said. So at some basic level, it's like low cost, but more importantly, low barriers to entry. And I'm gonna come back to that, just easy design and flexibility. Okay. So coming back to also the thing that Gabe said, just Citing a paper from economics, one of my favorites is a paper I had the pleasure to be the editor of, the American Economic Review by Eric Snowberg and Yat Yariv, that compared, did some of the laboratory experiments, this is the laboratory part, and ran those in two physical laboratory, has results from UBC, it would be the dotted yellow line, and then has results also from CCS, is actually a sample of Caltech students, which amazingly, they got nearly every Caltech student to participate. There is actually some pretty colorful anecdotes I achieved that. I'm not gonna repeat the colorful anecdote, but they got some 85% response rate in this you know, kind of really selected uh, Caltech sample. So that would be like really high, you know, you can call it IQ or whatever, but like a very technical population, a more typical lab experiment. And then you have MTurk in the dotted blue line, and then you have a representative sample the population. I forget exactly which one they use, but say something like RAND. And what they did is they ran some of the most typical laboratory experiments. So if you take game theory or something, it would be like that. One is the dictator game. The dictator game, you have $10. You're a dictator, so you just said, how much of that would you like to share with the random, with an anonymous recipient? That's like a very rough measure of generosity. So you can see the cumulative distribution function. That's the second one. That's the dictator giving. And, uh, you know, there are some differences here. The MTurk is kind of a little different from uh, the laboratory sample. But if you look at most of the other ones, um, reported heads with five flips is a really interesting one. You tell people, um, throw, uh, you know, a coin five times and then tell me how many heads did you get? And you get paid a dollar for every head. So it's an honesty test, uh, how honest people are when you could, clearly you're not monitoring them. That looks really, um, you know, uh, pretty uh, similar, the representative sample and the MTurk. And, and then there's some the derivative matrices, which is like not surprising, the Caltech does a little better. So there are some differences. The last one is a test of, the last one is a, a IAT for implicit discrimination, but there's some differences, but by and large, not even in an obvious, way that you would expect necessarily. And what I find even kind of more, going back to one of the last of Gabe's point, here they actually ran the same task with half the pay or double the pay and with more or less screening. Um, actually, I asked them to this because they'd run it with the same pay that they'd given on an online, online sample, which meant way overpaying relative to the typical pay. So you might've been worried. And I say, run them a typical pay. For this, for this one, zero difference. But screening in general is super important. Like if you did something where people need to look more at the details, like whether you do or not screening um, definitely matters. Something which is pretty clever, the last thing I'll talk about their paper, then I'll just share three anecdotes. They uh, basically elicited for each of the key measures, two measures of it. And then they look at the correlation between the two to get a measure of measurement error, how noisy it is. People are paying no attention, they give, the first time they give one answer, the other time they might give a very different answer. So that would be high measurement error. So the number there is the estimate of how much noise there is in people's responses for each of these questions. You know, in some cases, the MTurk is a little noisier than the Caltech or UBC. It's actually not, uh, you know, it's not as systematic. And it looks like it's often less noisy than the representative sample. So this is kind of like Gabe said, it's not representative, but actually people are kind of, paying attention more than you think they would, given what you paid them and so on. Okay, so I just want to add with three, end with three anecdotes, which kind of, to me, say, like, tell the impact of this kind of revolution of having online samples. And again, I don't mean this to be just MTurk. It could be also prolific other platforms like this. Research transparency. So I've heard this story. I just love this story. So um, I think, I think we all think that the more transparency and replication we could have, the better it would be for all of our disciplines. Uh, Berkeley, 
has been a pioneer in this, at least within the economics with the BITS, the Institute for Transparency and, and other work, but setting this aside. So I talked to colleagues kind of at us that are kind of actually between social psychology, decision making economics, and they say, gee, I read this article and that was really strange to me. I just logged in an hour later. I programmed it on MTurk. I got the response two hours later. I replicated the results. How empowering and wonderful that is that you can basically make headways in understanding things and then decide to do that way, as opposed to trying to fill the research, even going the laboratory month and IRB. I mean, in this case, if you're actually really doing it for publication, you're gonna have to do IRB. But the point is, it is wonderful to be able to have this quick access to obtain data and the impact on replicability is something I hadn't thought about. I thought that was really interesting. Second one is PhD students. We really feel for cases in which, let's say, as faculty, we're running projects and might cost $10,000, $20,000, we know that it's going to be hard for PhD students to do that. So one thing which is amazing is AmTurk makes it possible for PhD students often to run completely well-powered studies, and it's within the budget. I, I remember one day I had this PhD student that said, I had this, I, I had this question about whether uh, people anticipate others having the same biases that they have, say overconfidence on. And so I was having office hours with you like that day. So yesterday night I ran a small MTOR pilot to collect evidence. Just love that, you know, like it's basically so empowering. So you came with 30 observations as opposed to just how we usually do introspection, N equal to one, <laughs> you know, and if you're Danny Kahneman, you have magic introspection, but not everybody necessarily does. So I love the, how in a way this lowers inequality in that way, inequality in access to study samples and so on. I think that's a inequality reducing impact of this population in that way. And then the final one, in a pandemic. I mean, imagine being a laboratory experimenter, laboratory shut down. So a lot of the papers I've handled by people that did this, it was it's kind of really saved their uh, academic continuation career, the ability to be able to say, okay, I was going to run this experiment in the X lab at Berkeley. Well, I can't do that for at least a year or something, but I was able to go online. So uh, you know, I think for at least those researchers, it was really an important lifeline in a year that has been difficult in so many other ways, it, at least it helped in that. Thank you. Thank you, Sufana. Ali, we have Ali next. So I didn't bring any slides or anything like that. So I was figuring that I would just talk a little bit uh, and um, yeah, so thanks everybody for coming. Uh, all thousands of you, please don't zoom out. Um, uh, so unlike uh, Gabe and Stefano, uh, the sort of work that I typically do um, or have done in the past has uh, been studying the crowd workers themselves rather than studying a subject and then arriving at the studying of that subject through the crowd workers that, uh, that we're talking about today. Um, and so that's taken the form of a couple of different research projects like uh, uh, we are Dynamo, which basically explored collective action among crowd workers. Um, a, a paper that basically kind of another paper about piecework, which basically characterized a lot of this sort of uh, gig work based sort of stuff as uh, something that's really historically situated, stuff that we have seen for more than 100 years and continue to see today in the form of this really precarious, really small piece rate uh, remuneration sort of scheme. And uh, sort of just generally trying to make sense of a lot of the stuff that uh, Turkers are going through and workers uh, who do gig work and other sorts of forms of work like that uh, are experiencing as they as they engage with these platforms. And um, as I was listening to Gabe and Stefano, some of the, the questions and some, some of the sort of quirks that they were observing sort of uh, made sense to me from a very, like a radically different perspective. And I thought I would, I would really like to sort of comment on some of those because I think that also helps explain sort of like why there is this kind of incongruity or uh, like why things don't necessarily make sense from the perspective of a, of a cognitive scientist or a psychologist or an economist. And um, so some of those that sort of come to mind are like this question of like whether workers uh, are sort of like learning too quickly about like what the like nature of the task is or uh, talking amongst each other and things like that. And that just sort of reminded me of uh, uh, Mary Gray's work from 2015, where she and uh, her collaborators found that Turkers are constantly talking with each other because they're constantly trying to figure out like 
I just want to do what the instructions are telling me to do. What's what am I supposed to do? And so they're not even trying to game the system. They're just trying to not get stiffed. They're trying to not they're trying to get paid. Mm. Uh, and so they want to do what they're asked to do, but they don't know really what what they're what's being asked of them. And so very rapidly, she and her collaborators were finding that people were talking about the nature of the tasks and like, how do I do this? What should I do? Uh, what will get this task approved? Mm. Um, and so uh, very quickly, you're seeing that like these network these workers are highly networked um, and and talking with each other and trying to to exchange notes um it also uh reminded me of uh, there, like there is this question that like i don't think is is adequately settled um that i think uh gabe and stefano were both talking about about this question of uh sort of like worker uh, uh like whether paying people more will get better results and i think that on an individual case uh basis the findings at least from the hci space are that it doesn't really make that much of a difference people are about as accurate as they are and they they do their best um, I think that the difference is that if you can pay more and if you can establish certain thresholds and, and requirements of like uh, of, of, you, of being a worker to be eligible for the task, then uh, workers who can turn down uh, nebulously defined tasks or can turn, turn down requesters who they don't recognize, they will do that. And so uh, very often what we see or what I've seen in my work is uh, initially when I put out a task, uh, a lot of workers would sort of skip by it, even though it seems nominally to pay quite well. And it takes a little while to sort of earn the credibility, earn the reputation, earn the status. And uh, for Turkers to recognize like Ali pays, he uh, he doesn't he doesn't reject the task, uh, the work, and then and then take the data. Um, and so that can be this like somewhat difficult relationship to to even think about because like I I at least when I was doing in person studies uh, in my undergrad. I wasn't thinking like I need to establish this relationship with the people that I'm studying. I mean, like I did as an anthropologist, but that wasn't the sort of thing that I thought about in the context of like psych studies. Um, and and that's absolutely not how that works in mechanical Turk. It's very much a community, very much a culture. And um, and so there there are the, sort of those those sorts of uh, questions. I think that one of the other things that I really want to uh, like stress is um, there's this decontextualization of what what's going on with workers uh, and what their cultural backgrounds are, who they are. Um, these are things that are always issues. Uh, like we talk about, um, like if you do a psych study at a university, like you're getting a psych, you're getting the results of a psych study, at, like UC Berkeley, uh, possibly from some of the people around the university. But very often, many many psych students who are obligated <laughs> to uh, to participate in these studies to pass the class that they're taking, and um, these are all issues. But they're they're not sort of eliminated when you go online. They're just different. And in mm -hmm. some of these cases, it's you know, uh, this person's not going to get paid their five cents or 10 cents for this task if they don't do the task the way that they think the requester is looking for. So it's very, it's very uh, complicated. It do, we, we don't, like, we don't get any free lunches by moving on to Mechanical Turk. We just sort of like uh, shift some of the problems away. So instead of having this concern of like the power dynamics of an undergrad who wants to satisfy or please or please the grad student, now you have this financial relationship where you're paying uh, again, like uh, like Gabe was saying, like uh, pennies um, to to do this sort of research, and this is now the relationship that you have with the people that you're that you're working with. Um, so the sort of stuff that Nila Farsalehi and I, um, through Dynamo and and uh, Michael Bernstein and I, through uh, the research that we were doing back in grad school, have been sort of concluding on is that really we should be trying to think of the research that we do uh, that involves Turkers, whether it's studying Turkers themselves or studying a subject or a topic or a domain through Turkers as the participants, is try to think of this as a relationship that you try to foster and build and, and nurture because these are people and as uh, much as we would like to think that they sort of like pass through and are sort of stateless, the reality is that they are human beings who are uh, just as affected and sort of um, and left affected by the research and the treatments that we that we bring to them as as anybody is, um, and it really does help to uh, be as clear as possible, to be as communicative as possible, um, to to try to be as humane as possible to the people that we're working with, and and also to think of it as as working with people rather than uh, running a study on them or something like that. Um, it's a different sort of mindset, and it potentially problematizes some of the frameworks and things like that that. Uh, some some researchers tend to come at their their research questions with, but I think that it also leads you to a much richer sort of understanding of why you get certain findings or why things don't necessarily add up. Um, and I totally agree with with what both of the researchers were saying that Mechanical Turk has opened up so much access to to do uh, to participate in research, but also to to like make 
ends meet, um, I've talked to, I don't even know how many dozens of people uh, who have said that they, they couldn't work until Mechanical Turk made it possible for them to do that, mm -hmm. um, that they weren't able to participate in any research studies or anything like that because they weren't near any universities. Uh, I remember a time before Mechanical Turk was the, the dominant form of, of psych and sort of behavioral research. And you got a lot of people between the ages of like 20 and 30, and it was really not representative of the world uh, in, in really problematic and frustrating ways. And Mechanical Turk, again, not a panacea, it doesn't solve all the problems, but it solves some of them or it, it uh, like ameliorates some of them. Uh, but, but we do need to be conscious of how it shifts other problems around as well. So that's sort of the uh, stray thought that I had that uh, from the perspective of somebody who, who studies Turkers specifically without sort of like the another sort of like goal in mind of like this, this idea of like the psych or uh, economic behavioral sort of uh, uh, like principles and things like that. Um, I'm seeing the sorts of things that you all are talking about. And I'm like, wow, this is like, I'm, I'm seeing this sort of stuff too. But uh, I guess I'm seeing it from a slightly different perspective. And hopefully the three of us or the four of us together can, can try to bring some clarity to some of the questions that people have today. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Okay, okay so we have a bunch of questions. Um, do, do, do any of you have questions that you want to ask that are here? Do you want to go ahead? And then I'll go to the chat. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. I guess I'll go first then. Uh, hello. So I'm an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. And my question was about the value of qualitative research through Qualtrics, or sorry, through MTurk. So recently I ran a study on MTurk with all this, all the precautions that people typically take, 95% hit rate, captures, et cetera. And there was a question by survey about just an open in the question asking them to evaluate the policy that we were testing. And of the, so it was optional. So of the responses we got, only 25% elected to answer that open-ended question, even though we worded it so that it will only have to be maybe 30, 40 words. And on top of that, of the of those responses, around 30% were just copy pasted directly from Wikipedia, from a Google results, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, a lot of them actually copy pasted the same exact sort of quotes, which I think speaks to the level of, uh, I guess, communication and networking between mm -hmm. m But my question is about what, what value can we get out of those forms of like, Open and the qualitative answers through MTurk, and how what we can do as researchers to improve the quality of responses we get if we're interested in such like qualitative research that we typically get through interviews and field experiments. I'm happy to to continue talking. Um, yeah, so uh, feel free if if the microphone's not uh, loud enough to let me know. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that when it comes down to it, if you are Going to be paying people money and like let's let's use like five cents for the task as an example if they're trying to aim for ten dollars an hour they need to be moving on to the next task within like some number of seconds like they need to be hitting like i think 200 they need to be getting 200 tasks approved within every hour to to be hitting i think ten dollars an hour or whatever it is so um and and that's assuming that every requester approves their task and all that other stuff so that's all to sort of like lay the groundwork to say that if you tell them that they don't have to answer the question at all i mean like why why on earth would they because they have they have like 900 other tasks that they need to go to and uh and then aside from that there's this like disambiguous or there's this ambiguous kind of question of uh are you asking them to give you a correct answer or do they think that you're trying to get a correct answer in which case yeah wikipedia is fine um like to them like they they think like why would i even bother writing my own words because this person just wants an answer and i can go to wikipedia and give them it or are they like do they read the instructions as like, oh, I, I actually need to stop and reflect on this. I need to I need to give my thoughts on this or something like that. And um, and the difficulty of communicating what your intention is, what your what kind of answer you're looking for is, and and also like both of the other panelists have said, like you, the more you explain, the more you're sort of like seeding the ground for them to just give you exactly what you're asking for. Um, and and so like all of that's quite quite challenging. But I think like these these sort of make qualitative field work, at least like to me, th like directly through Mechanical Turk, really problematic and really difficult. Um, and I tend to start with Mechanical Turk as sort of like a filtering space and then move on to something more long form where I can actually talk with the person uh, either through IRC or chat or something like that uh, or over email or something and mm. uh, and try to like, like uh, disconnect it from the idea that they're making like, I don't know, five cents or a dollar or five dollars from whatever they're interacting with me on uh, over email. 
Um, I think another thing that helps is to offer to bonus them after the fact. Uh, if, um, but you have to be very careful to actually do that because uh, it's really problematic to promise to bonus people or to say, I might bonus the best answer or something like that. That's, that's not great. Uh, so uh, yeah, they're, they're sort of like all of these considerations. Uh, I don't know whether some of those have, whether you've tried some of those or, or, or not, but also like just, there's going to be like this thing in the air for them that like, I have so many other tasks that I need to do. This person's asking me to spend a long time writing. I, I can't. Well, the context of the yeah. question was worded so that uh, it was just to reflect on if they've learned anything. Oh, sorry. Oh. The question was just to reflect if they learned anything new. And then a lot of work was just, just, I guess, used entries from Google that were actually not in the contents of the survey, for example. We were simply asking them to reflect. But I, I appreciate your answer because it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 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 And, and just to like sort of like put like put a, pin, put a pin on that last thought, like it is one thing to be like quite certain that you worded it clearly. Um, and then like another thing to be quite certain that the Turker who's sort of like skimming the instructions, like internalized it in the in the way that you wanted them to. Um, and so that's that's like this thing that you'll we will just never get an answer to, unfortunately. It's a really an interesting response because I have used open-ended responses quite often and mm -hmm. I just pay more mm -hmm. because I'm thinking I, I need to mm -hmm. because I'm asking them to pause and I will use Qualtrics on MTER and the window won't advance unless they write a certain number of sentences. But to hear the mentality of the MTurker, like uh, in this, well, you know, two minutes, whatever, I have to do this many tasks. I hadn't thought about it that way. And so that's really important. It's making me pause and really think about the implications of that mentality of the serious MTurk worker who yeah. is there to, you know, help their making a living, yeah. you know? So, but I, I have, you know, and but I pay more accordingly and it's been useful um they're not just cut and paste because they're often about their personal experiences in my psycho psychology world yeah yeah i think chris milan uh who's been studying mechanical turk for for ages and ages has said something along the lines of like there's a very small cohort of turkers who take this work really seriously and yeah. uh they are doing most of the most of the tasks um and uh they i think like the consequence of that is that like they they have like a very very like sort of streamlined Way of doing these tasks and they're thinking because this is work this, this isn't a hobby for a lot of them like yeah. this is how they make rent uh and and so this is like this they, like exactly like you said that they have a, a process for it yeah did you guys want to add anything or you're good no okay. i thought that was great answers yeah was there another question there and then we'll go to the chat i yeah. mean the question and answer yeah yeah thanks so 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 my question is um to like sort of comparing MTurk with other similar platforms um, that are out there. I know that more of them exist. And I'm wondering specifically in terms of external validity and representativeness, if there are, you know, performs better or worse, or if there are others that perform better. Um, if, I, if I'm trying to uh, get a representative, more of a representative sample, right now I'm mostly using Lucid. You pay about a dollar per respondent. I think they say you could do a survey as long as 15 minutes. That just seems way too much to ever ask a survey respondent. So mostly our surveys are like five or six minutes. Uh, it has many of the same problems of Mechanical Turk in terms of lots of people, bots, something going through your surveys very fast without, uh, without paying much attention. So you need a lot of screeners on that. But it does seem like a more demographically representative sample um, of the United States. I think Prolific also provides something they claim is a more demographically representative sample. I haven't tried that option on Prolific yet. So. Oh, I was just thinking, um, I don't know if any if either of you read the Verge article last week about um, a TikToker posted a video yeah. Where, where she was like, hey, if you want to make a couple of extra bucks, like you can go to this website, it's called Prolific and you can do surveys. And it wrecked somebody's studies. Like, um, it, it many has, people's yeah. studies. Uh, yeah, I like, I think somebody posted like a chart where they were like, I have like 86% female, female respondents. Yeah. Like, I don't know what's going on. Like what's happening? Uh -huh. um, and this is like not, I mean, TikTok, like that that part was like, interest like really interesting um but make it, uh my my understanding of mechanical turk from a 2010 uh, demographic study and then a 2015 study and i think a more recent one is it skews more uh like more women than uh the general population um and again i think like this sort of goes back to what i was saying before that like it has enabled people who are, are at home taking care of their kids or taking care of family or whoever um to to participate in work that they would never have been able to do 
if not for crowdsourcing and things like that. So um, it's not, yeah, it's not, at least Mechanical Turk does not have very strong um, mechanisms to ensure representative samples and things like that. Uh, and I think at the very least, try to be cognizant of either sort of people not being totally forthright or um, the, the dimensions that you're trying to get representative cases on not necessarily being messed okay. up. Comparing different platform, just brief, one dimension that didn't strike me as important until I ran into it is, is an economist in particular. Amturk is very transparent about incentive for respondents and pay. Like, okay. you know, you set it up and it goes to them. We tried to do an experiment to get a more present sample with one of these sort of platforms without naming it. And uh, it turned out, even though they said, yeah, we'll implement your incentives, they didn't really do it. They did it in a very weird way. They, the incentives were given as reward cards and then they set themselves the exchange rate for every subject because they said, you know, higher income people need a higher exchange rate. But in practice, that meant I had no control about what I was doing, but they weren't telling me that. So oh. one thing to really watch out is if you're doing not quality work, but if, if I as an economist, I want to know, I might need to, it, M MTurk at least is very transparent. Some of the other platforms, in order to recruit a sample and extra reward, they really don't, um, they're not at all, they don't tell you what they're doing with rewards. Okay, um, uh, just one technical thing, Marianne, this is, I think a question for you. Are the slides for the two speakers that had slides going to be made available? Somebody's asking in the question and answer, would that be possible? Maybe with the link okay. to the video or something? That's fine, bye. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, terrific. Okay, one another question um, from the question and answer box. What has been your personal experiences dealing with bots? Um, I'm, I'm happy to go really briefly. I remember when uh, more than a decade ago, when we first started using Mechanical Turk, we devised a few tests to look for bots and found very little sign of any of, of it. I think that's changed as um, more people have learned how to try to exploit these sorts of systems to the detriment of researchers and the detriment of the other workers on it. You now have to deal with all these uh, sort of bot detection. Um, I, for, I remember looking a few months ago at the percent of bots that Qualtrics said we were getting. I can't remember what it was, but it was definitely several percentage points. The main test they seem to use is one of these Google CAPTCHA-like services, which just seems to look, um, tries to detect through uh, ways that are they never say because they don't want people to learn to, to game them. Um, is there a person behind these clicks and typing or is there a computer behind them that somehow codes it that way? I don't know if you have insights into that. Um, I mean, I, I, I only know that it's also a huge problem for the workers themselves because yeah. uh, again, like the, the, mm. the very determined, the very serious Turkers that, I, that I've talked to are, very proud of the work that they do like they they are determined to yeah. not be perceived as <clears throat> as like cheats or anything like that and so and so that i think like partly also motivates like while well, they'll contact the requester and be like i'm really sorry i messed up this thing yeah. and it's like i'm like i totally would have not cared but like it's an incredibly intact like well it shows a lot of integrity to like that they volunteer to like bring that. my attention to it um but but yeah like so th this is a this like I, from the turkers that i've talked to this is a tremendous issue because they they don't want the platform in which they work to be perceived as a place where bots are sort of fabricating data. And um, I, I'm, yeah, like I, I think like the only sort of solution that I've had to it has been to try to establish an ongoing relationship with the workers. And it becomes somewhat clear over time that the person that you're working with is like not, not real <laughs> um, and, and stuff. Oh. But, uh, but yeah, like if you're just doing like large scale sort of like surveys and stuff like that, that's really hard. And I don't have a good answer for that. Okay, um, uh, another question about uh, experience using, um, actually using MTERIC, experience using qualifications. I'm actually not sure what that means. Are they worth the extra money um, or does it put a strain on your project budget? So do we know what they mean by qualifications? Is it like uh, screening criteria or? Yeah, so you can do, uh, there are at least two kinds of qualifications. I mean, like there are two categories that I'm, I'm aware of. Uh, one is like you can request like master Turkish oh, or yes. something like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I forgot what the exact terminology was, 
uh, I have found that as like one, it costs quite a bit more. Uh, Mechanical Turk takes like a higher cut, and I haven't found it to be, I haven't found it to be a good thing for the buck. Um, the other qualification thing that you can do is you can you can set various criteria where you can say like the Turker needs to have done this many hits in their lifetime. Their approval rate needs to be this. They like, and you can I think like there are a number of other. And uh, every dimension. extra dimension cost makes the cost a little bit more. So that those ones, I don't think they do, uh, unless they oh. could change something. It was just the master Turker sort of like mm. filter that that like they do charge more. Uh, I forgot if it, like they actually charge more or if they say like you should probably pay more. Um, but I'm pretty sure that they charge a little bit more for for that pool. Um, I yeah, I think that like the the like the Turker has to have done more than ten thousand hits and they have to have like a ninety five percent approval rate or higher. Like those things, I don't think that they cost anything to implement. They're just sort of technically extra work, um, which depending on like your technical expertise with the API, which last time I saw was not very well documented, um, may be a pretty substantial cost. But uh, it's not not too hard to implement those yeah. those sorts of requirements. Do you guys use them? I know my graduate students do do the master Turks criteria when they uh, use uh, yeah no i don't yeah i haven't done master Turk, but ever i've used like 95 percent approval and yeah some hundred plus whatever number of previous tests it can't hurt it seems i mean but it does cost more right i think yeah. like with, with the master Turk requirement i think it's a good shorthand to make sure that you're going to get good results but i think that like there are a, an enormous number of turkers who just for reasons that they they don't know and uh, mechanical Amazon won't disclose for whatever reason are just never they're not never selected to be master turkers or anything huh. like that. Um, and so there's that sort of like unclarity of like what even are the qualifications? Um, I see. And so that that becomes like this weird fuzzy space. Um, so that that made me me somewhat sort of reluctant to use it myself. Huh. Okay, Mari, do you have a comment? Yes, please. Uh, I, I Thank you. Uh, I, I was just wondering if there um, if there is a population that specializes in answering academic surveys. I mean, if, if there's a way on mechanical care to sort of select the kind of things that you do, and if that's a problem for the work, the research that you implement there. Yeah, what, so one thought on that is that the um, what you say your study is about probably to some extent drives the pool of respondents that come to your study. And you just need to be very careful about what words you put up there about your study and both not deceiving people and at the same time, not attracting a certain kind of person. So I often, since I, I don't want, often for my studies, I don't want political junkies to be taking the studies because most people aren't political junkies. I often say, just this is a survey. I won't mention that it's about politics in the description because then I'll know I'll get a certain kind of worker that I don't necessarily want. It's fine to have some, just don't want the whole, whole sample. Um, I can imagine similar um, issues might apply with other, with other sort of disciplines. I guess the one other quick interesting finding from there is there's a nice, a couple of nice papers that try to get the size of the total pool of mechanical Turk workers by using one of these um, tag and uh, retest um, methods um, that like people in the fishing industry use to like they'll tag fish, uh, put them back, catch some more fish, see how many they get back. Huh. And at least in early, you know, it's probably four huh. or five years ago now, the pool was a lot smaller based on these estimates um, from this work, then everybody kind of guessed it might have been. I think at the time it looked like the pool was about four, four thousand or five thousand with uh, of regular mentor users. That and the life expectancy was only about six months, eight months, something like that. Or half life was about six months, something like that. So it's a smaller. It may have gotten larger, especially during the pandemic. But it's a smaller pool than we might sort of hope. Anyone else? So do we need to, uh, we're at time. Should yes. we stop things there or? Yes, I think uh, if there are questions, we can just, uh, I guess. Oops, I don't know where the camera is, I forget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just uh, thank you 
all. This was really a, a, a wonderful discussion. I also want to th thank the Matrix staff, Iva Seto, Chuck Kapelke, and also Julia Zizek, who participated, you know, who really helped put together this panel and who had the original idea. So thank you all. And uh, well, I hope that uh, this conversation can continue because it's really, uh, it's really very rich. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank yeah. you.